So thankful to be in the house of the Lord today. What a presence of God we feel in this place. Amen. God has been moving in this service from the very beginning. And I want you to grab your Bibles this morning. We're going to turn to the book of Numbers. I preached out of Numbers last week. I'm going to preach out of it again this week. Numbers chapter number 22. Amen. Numbers chapter 22. Last week I, I used Psalms 106 and 5, I think it was from my text. It said, Then stood Phinehas up and executed judgment, and the plague was stayed. How many remembers that? And I talked about good old brother Balaam, Numbers chapter 25. How that he tried to curse the people of God and couldn't curse them. Because every time he opened his mouth, God put a blessing in there. And Balaam told King of Moab, Balak, he said, I can't curse them. But if you can get them to rebel against God, they'll bring a curse on themselves. Well, I can't get Brother Balaam out of my mind. So I'm going to preach about Balaam today. Numbers chapter 22, we're going to preach backwards. Numbers chapter 22, verse number 20. Bible said, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Listen. And God's anger. Everybody say God's anger. God's anger was kindled because Balaam went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. The Bible said Balaam got up in the morning. Got his self together. Put a saddle on the donkey. Started on his way. When that donkey took the first step, the Bible said the anger of the Lord was kindled. Someone said, well, why would God be mad? God told him to go. Yeah, but God had told him the first time not to. And when God tells you something once, that's good enough. He don't need to say it twice. Jesus, I'm asking you to anoint me this morning from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I bind every spirit of the enemy. Loose the Holy Ghost in this house. Let revelation flow through this building. I pray that there be a free flow of your spirit that would saturate this building today. Let my mouth speak your words in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the fear of the Lord. Charles Dickens introduces the book, A Tale of Two Cities, with a paradox. He said, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And that seems to be the summary of the life of Brother Balaam. He was the best of the prophets. And he was the worst of the prophets. In fact, were we able to fast forward Balaam into our generation, he probably would be one of our most sought after preachers because he had a silver tongue and he was full of charisma. But he was a devil in prophet's clothes. Theologians mention him as being a prophet, but along with that, they mark him as a soothsayer and a magician. And when you read the summary of the prayers, prophecies, and exhortations of Balaam, it would speak that would speak to you in the book of Numbers. You will find that he was a very gifted man. He was a very gifted speaker. He knew how to use words. He was a wordsmith. He used words like, let me die the death of the righteous. Let my last end be like this. It's 
strong words were used by Balaam, full of meaning and purpose. But they were void of something that was lasting. Listen to his description of the character of God. He said, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Balaam, the man who was, a, who was gifted as a prophet, was an imposter who was full of deceit. However, the eloquence with which Balaam preached was enough to fool both Moses and all of the children of Israel. His problem was that he placed all of his tears in his voice rather than in his soul. He urged repentance and reformation in his powerful appeals to the children of Israel. But repentance and reformation was absent in his life. You think of Brother Balaam and his all-night prayer meetings. On his knees, begging for the guidance and the direction of God. But all of his anxious moments, perplexing problems, the desperation in his own prayer was marred by a terrible flaw called self-deceit. If I get a little monitor, please, something just happened up here. He heard what he wanted to hear from God. He became consumed with what time held for him instead of what eternity promised. Despite all of this, Balaam was a prophet who saw far beyond those who lived with him in that day. For he prophetically proclaimed, A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. He was speaking and prophesying of a coming Messiah who was on the distant horizon. This is the simple epitaph that was written of Balaam in Numbers chapter 31 and verse number 8. This is what was said of him. Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. Slain by his own people. Killed by the Israelites. For when they came to destroy the kings of Moab and Midian, Balaam was in their midst. So we must take up a trip to Moab's battlefield. And there we see heaps and rows and piles and avenues of the dead. Vultures and jackals have now shredded the carcasses of those that have lost their life in a hideous feast. There we come and stumble upon a man. Who is this man laying dead? Brother Josh in the period pyramid of the Midianites. His clothes betray him as a prophet of God. His sightless eyes now gaze up into the heaven. Balaam! Balaam! Is that you? Balaam! How in God's name did you get here? Balaam, how did you fall among the enemy? Balaam, the best and worst of prophets, would respond and tell you today, God let me go, but God didn't go with me. I was permitted, but I was not blessed. He said I could go, he didn't follow along behind. And I find myself in a tragic ending. I find myself in a place I should have never been. Let, let, me just, let me just tell you the story of Balaam behind the text that I read to you today. When the children of Israel had 
had reached the borders of Moab and Midian. The kings of those countries feared that they would be overthrown by the mass of Israelites. They had witnessed what had happened to Og, the king of Bashan. I talked about that last week. And they had witnessed what had happened to Sihon, the king of the Amorites. And so they came up with a plan. They said, we've got to find us a preacher. We've got to find us somebody that, that can preach and prophesy, bless and curse. And so they found Balaam. Because Balaam had quite a reputation. He was known by everybody far and wide that whatever he blessed was blessed and whatever he cursed was cursed. The kings of Moab and Midian sent messengers to Balaam prophesying a big reward and prophesying that if he would curse, just, just curse Israel. And if you'll curse Israel, we'll give you money. We'll give you honor. We'll give you prestige. And Balaam invited them when they showed up at his house. And they said, Balaam, if you'll just curse Israel, we'll give you all of this. We'll bless you. We'll make you famous. We'll give you money. We'll give you honor. We'll give you prestige, whatever you want. And when they showed up at his door, Balaam should have slammed the door in their face and said, I rebuke you. Get you out of here. But Balaam was interested in what they were peddling. And he opened the door and welcomed them into his house and said, hang on just a minute. Let, let, let me just find out. Let me just pray a little while and, and, and let me see when I inquire of the Lord what he has to say. And so Balaam went in and he began to pray and, and he inquired of God and God began to talk to Balaam and God instructed him. He said, stay away from those men. You can't curse Israel because I have blessed them. So the next morning, Balaam got with the men, the messengers that came from the king of Moab, Balak. He said, I can't go with you because God won't let me go. And they went home and told Balak. said, Balaam said he can't come. God won't let him come. So the Bible said that Balak, king of Moab, sent more powerful messengers, more honorable men, sent bigger prizes and much more money, and they went and they offered him greater rewards and greater honor. And Balaam said, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond what God has explicitly told me to do, but hang on. Let me pray again. I'm, not, I'm telling you right straight out of the Bible. Now, if God said don't go the first time, Balaam should have said, you're wasting your time. But Balaam liked his flesh more than he liked God. And Balaam liked money, and he liked honor. He liked prestige, and he liked his flesh petted, and he liked everybody to say, oh, look at Brother Balaam. And so he went along and said, hang on. If they, would give me, if they would give me Balak, king of Moab's house full of silver and gold, I can't do anything that God don't let me do. But let me go and pray about it again. When Balaam prayed again this time, something a little odd took place. Instead of God telling him, no, don't go. This time God came to him and said, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. So Balaam got up, saddled his ass, and went with the Midianites. And the next verse said, God's anger was kindled because he went. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, we, we must be on guard every moment of our lives. There is a devil out there that's out to destroy us. 
Bible said that the thief cometh not before to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his number one goal and mission is to ruin you and to rob you and to take from you the purpose of God in your life and, and to steal from you the things that God ha has placed upon you. And so we've got to guard ourselves every moment of our lives. We've got to watch ourselves. We've got to watch our words, our attitudes, and, and our emotions because the enemy... We will not rest until he has captured our soul. Let, let me tell you, there are two things that we all here today must remember. Number one, the enemy never gives up. Number two, God doesn't need to speak twice. I said, you better remember God or the enemy never gives up and God doesn't need to speak twice. God's will was plainly revealed to Balaam the first time the enemy came to call. But in Balaam's backslidings, he welcomed these men into his home knowing full well they were bent on destroying God's people. And the enemy's messengers intrigued Balaam and, and he allowed them to stay around too long. Balaam said, I, 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 I can't curse Israel, but spend the night with me. I can't curse Israel, but come eat at my table. I, I can't curse Israel, but let's be friends. Balaam. I wished I could talk to you today. I wished I could speak to you. Balaam, God said it. There's no need for God to say it again. He doesn't need to speak to you the second time to prove what he said the first time. God said it once and once is enough. Let, let me tell you something. When you, when you tinker, when you tinker with the things of God, and you tinker with the purpose of God in your life, and you tinker with what God wants to do under the guise of let me pray about it. Hey, I believe in praying. I think you ought to pray. But there's some things you don't need to pray about. I, I, mean, there's some, I, I don't need to pray about some things. I already know the answer. And I can say, let me pray about it, but I'm going to tell you what I'll do. I'm going to get God angry at me. I'm going to get God upset at me. I'm going to get the anger of the Lord kindled against me. And when Balaam prayed the second time, God said, all right, Balaam, if that's what you want, go. It's not my will, but if it's your will, go. God said, go ahead and go. I ain't going with you. I'd say, you have my permission, but you don't have my blessing. God said, I'll allow you to do it, but I'm not going to bless you. And listen, some, sometimes, sometimes people think that just because God gives them permission over something means that God is blessing them. How wrong they are. Permission does not carry God's approval. Permission does not imply God's blessing. Now, when, when I was younger, my mama was different than my dad. I was too scared to bug my father. But I'd bug my mother. And she'd say, no, no, no. So finally, I'd torment her enough. She said, go ahead. I knew what that meant. It meant you can go, but I'm not going. And you can go, but your daddy's going to get you. <laughs> Sometimes people think that God, his permission to do something means that God is blessing them, but they are wrong. 
How do, how do you know that? I've got Bible to back me up what I'm preaching about this morning. Let me take you to the Old Testament. Hey, men, to the place called Kabroth Hatava. The children of Israel were there, and they began to murmur. The Bible said they, they were sick. They were tired of manna. They got up in the morning, it was manna. They went to bed at night, it was manna. And they, all they did was eat manna, 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 manna. It was angel's food. They should have been thankful that God was blessing them to provide them with some substance and sustenance. But they got tired of it because that's like humanity. Hey, man, we get tired of things after a while. And, and we want something new and we want something better. And we want, we want more than what we already have. And so the Bible said they began to murmur and said, Oh, it would have been better if we were back in Egypt because in Egypt we had leeks and garlics and we had all all of that stuff, but here, all we got is this stinking manna. Said, we want meat. So the Bible tells us that God sent a wind that brought a flock of quail into the midst. And they collected barrels and barrels and barrels of quail. Listen, what else the Bible said? God sent them quail, Brother Danishek. He sent them more quail than they could eat. But the Bible tells us that while the flesh was still in their teeth, the wrath of God was kindled against them. And the psalmist says it like this. He gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul. Well, God, we asked for quail. We asked for meat. You sent it to us. What's the problem? Go ahead, Balaam. Go to Moab. More often than not, those that go to Moab never make it back. And for those who do make it back, they find themselves much like the condition of Naomi who went to Moab during a famine with her husband and two sons. And when she came back, she came back bent, broken, and bitter. I'm almost done if I can get some help on the music. There arises a series of verses in the New Testament that bring to us the pattern in the lives of men and women who are accustomed to becoming Balaam's in their life. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5 talks about the way of Balaam. Jude verse 11 talks about the error of Balaam. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 14 talks about the doctrine of Balaam. First of all, it begins with way. And then it leads to an era, which finally ends in a doctrine that destroys the man. One of the arresting facts in the story of Balaam is that God would use a dumb animal that Balaam was riding upon to speak to him one final time about the direction he was going. Balaam's on his way to talk to Balak. And the Bible said while he was riding his beast, the beast stopped. Because the beast has more spiritual perception than the prophet. And the beast sees an angel in the way with a sword drawn. The beast said, whoa, I can't go any further. And Balaam gets mad and smites the beast. And so the beast goes to the side. Balaam hits the beast again. The beast tries to go a little further and finally stops and falls down. And Balaam is so, he is so bent on what he wants, he gets up and beats the, the beast with his staff. Then something happened that's never happened in the course of human history. The beast started talking. It, the 
B started talking to him. B started telling him, hey, 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 there's an angel right there. I, I, I don't dare go. And then God opened his eyes, and he saw the angel with a sword drawn. And the Lord said, I'm paraphrasing now, but you better thank God that that donkey had more spiritual perception than you did because I was going to let that angel kill you. I hope I'd have had enough sense to say that. If it had been an angel standing there and that donkey would have stopped and I'd have started hitting that donkey and that donkey would have started talking back. We're not talking about Ed the talking boy. That donkey would have started talking back to me. I said, I'd have walked back home. I'd have walked back home. God said, Don't do that. Keep on showing me what I said. Bail him like a nut. Continues on his journey. Even after. God sent an angel. And even after, God caused the beast to talk. Lane goes his way. He tries to contradict the Lord. Balak gets so mad. He said, I've paid you all this to curse. All you do is bless. And he said, I can't curse what God blesses. But I'll tell you how you can get it. If you will send something their way that will cause them to rebel against God, God will curse them for their actions. You roll over, if you turn the pages in your Bible, just a few more slips. You come to Numbers 38. And there you'll find the epitaph of Balaam. Balaam. The son of Beor, they slew with the sword. God let him go, but God didn't go with him. Would you stand with me this morning? I wonder today. I wonder. I wonder. Or somebody step out of your seat, you'd make your way to this altar. You'd say, God, I don't want something for my life that you don't want me to have. And I don't want to go somewhere that you don't want me to go. And I don't want to pray and try to twist your arm to get what I want. But God, I need your blessings in my life more than I need your permission. I know it's heavy this morning, but I'm going to tell you something. I felt this thing so strong on me the last couple of days. I couldn't get Balaam out of my mind. I preached about him last week. I couldn't get him out of my mind. I, I got to get this off of me today. Somebody's got to understand that God is talking. God is reaching. God is trying to help you. God is trying to direct you. And you get what you want. But hear the man of God today. You won't want it once you get it. Good old brother Balaam. God said, no, but let me pray again. No, Balaam, you don't need to pray again. I, I don't want to be dramatic. But I have to tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. Taxi cab of trouble is on its way. And it's going to pull up to the curb, and you're going to have to get in, and trouble's going to take you for a ride. 
God's going to get your attention. No matter what he has to do. Pastor, why are you saying that? Because I have been terrified. Terrified. For weeks. And if I don't say it, I'm going to be held responsible. So I'm getting it off of me and I'm getting it on you. You can do with it whatever you want. You can take it or you can leave it. That's up to you. But I'm telling you, God may give you permission. But it doesn't mean he's going with you. And listen, if God doesn't go with you, there's nowhere in the world worth going by yourself. I've got to have Jesus more than anything in this world. If I gain everything in this world, but I don't have Jesus walking beside me, I don't have anything. And you say, Pastor, why are you doing this today? I don't know why I'm doing this other than I feel it burning in my soul. I'm giving the word to somebody. I pray to God, heed the word of the Lord. Don't get mad at the messenger. Don't get upset at the man of God. You got a problem with what was said today, you take it up with him. I'm going to tell you it was a word from heaven. It's a word from heaven. Bow your heads. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for all your wonderful people that's in this place today. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts, and we want to be pleasing in your sight. Pray that, Lord, as we go home today, you would go with us. Pray your hand would be upon each one of us. You would guide our steps and you would direct our lives. And you would make us what you want us to be. Let us walk in your divine purpose and plan for each of our lives. Let our church explode in revival and growth in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord. Go and the Lord go with you. I'll see you Tuesday night. Let, let me just make a quick announcement I forgot to announce. There, there, uh, if we can have some men and women that would volunteer to help with the church remodel this week, uh, if you can get with my wife and, and let, you, let her know your availability, there's some things that need to be moved and some things that need to be cleaned, and uh, we need to get on that right away. So if you could please get with my wife and let her know. Also, on Thursday night, instead of ladies' prayer, we're going to have church-wide prayer here in the gymnasium. Please come. Let's touch heaven together. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You're dismissed.